Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the CPS Board of Education Health and Safety Committee meeting for October the 24th. Um, I will not be taking a roll call today, but instead, I will just state who is here with us. And first off, we have board member, Vice President Jones, he is present here with us, um, of course, myself. And we have board member Moffitt, who has joined us virtually uh, via Blue Jeans, so she is here. We also have our legislative liaison, Mr. Kearney, who will be presenting to us today. And we also have Dr. Davis, who will also present as well. So as a reminder, I always like to um, just state that if you are tuned in virtually, the documents that we are reviewing are available on the CPS website via board docs. Um, members of the public who wish to speak, you may do so by clicking the chat button now. And we will leave the chat button or the chat feature, excuse me, open for about three minutes. Please submit your name, your affiliation to the district, your school community, your topic and your contact information. And if you want a direct response to any questions that you might have um, from this presentation. So we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Our first item on our agenda will come from our government liaison representative, um, Mr. Kearney. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Health and Safety Committee. Um, we provided a report last week. I should note that uh, George Glover is out of town uh, celebrating his first grandchild. So he's Congratulations. Uh, got good reason to be out of town. Um, so the legislative report is divided into two parts. The first part is newly introduced bills. The second part are articles that I think would be of concern and interest to you. I know that, um, Madam Chair, you're, you're very interested in HB 27, which is a property tax freeze authorization. It was introduced by Representative Patton. I served in the Ohio Senate with Representative Patton. And it's applicable to counties that have a county council. So that would be Summit County, for example, is one of the counties in Ohio that's run by a county council, also Cuyahoga County. Our county, as you know, we have three commissioners. We don't have a county council. So that particular bill is not applicable to Hamilton County. Thank you. Um, then um, you, can, you can see that a lot of the bills are honoring certain people. It's that time of year in the legislative cycle where these types of bills are introduced that you wanna get in before the end of the year, and there's going to be lame ducks starting uh, November 15th. And during lame duck, you will see uh, a lot of bills being merged together. And there's typically what's called a naming bill. So a lot of these that are honoring, let's say, oil and gas education, like there will be a license plate bill, there'll be an honoring bill, a naming bill, and those, all those individual bills will be rolled into one bill. Um, also, if you look at the news and review section, which begins at page five, it just goes through some of the highlight of the big stories in the state of Ohio, just so members of the committee are up on what's going on around our state. Um, Madam Chair, I know that you're interested in the bill that is noted in the first paragraph under the education section, and I'm at the top of page eight. That is HB 497, which would uh, eliminate mandatory retention for those students who have trouble with a third grade reading guarantee. Uh, that bill, I think, is going to have legs and uh, could potentially move during lame duck. And the reason that I say that is because uh, Representative Manning, who, who I served when she, I served with her when she was in the Senate, and uh, Representative Robinson, those are both chairs, chair and, and minority chair of the education committee, or the primary and secondary learning committee. And so they, they can definitely get it out of their committee, right? And so I don't think that Representative Manning would have introduced it if it didn't have a chance or support of the leadership. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Green, can you just elaborate a little bit more exactly on House Bill 497? I know that you mentioned that it's the third grade reading guarantee, but can you go a little bit into detail in terms of what they are um, possibly discussing? 
Well, I think that the way that it currently stands, and there, there's always a chance that it gets modified, is that um, students would have the opportunity uh, to take the test, uh, and if they did not did not uh, pass the third grade reading guarantee, they would still get to progress to the fourth grade, assuming everything else is is fine. Um, so you you may remember that under the under Governor Kasich's administration that this bill um, or the third grade reading guarantee was introduced, and um, now it looks like people are walking it back a little bit. Perhaps this is due to COVID and issues uh, with COVID, but it's got bipartisan support. It's got the the heads of the committee who are supporting it, and so I, I've got to imagine that leadership in the House and Senate will like it as well. And when do you think that they will come to a decision? Well, I would imagine that it would be during lame duck. So that would either, there'll be two weeks in November where they will meet, and there will be two weeks in December that they will meet. So there'll probably be four more weeks of session before the end of the year. Um, so this is already, it's already passed the House, and so it's in the Senate. Uh, Senator Huff, President Huffman, as you know, um, has some unique uh, views on education. I, I imagine that this will be one that, that he will like. Um, I have not had a chance to talk to um, Senator Thomas about this, who represents CPS, as well as Senator Blessing. As you know, Senator Blessing has come to at least two events that the board has asked him to attend, maybe even three. So I think he'll be interested. And then Senator Wilson also has uh, a little bit of CPS in his district. So I, I will make sure that I poll them and I can uh, find out exactly what they think about it, assuming that it comes to them for a vote. Um, well, I'll give myself a day, so by tomorrow. That would definitely be my ask. Um, I was gonna open it up for any of my colleagues or administration to ask any further questions about that topic. Board Member yeah. Jones. Um, thank you, just just regarding the topic, I think it might be helpful and I'm not quite sure, I, I, maybe if it's coming as a recommendation um, that we get a copy of the language of that. I, I think I'm hitting on what I believe um, our chairperson is saying in terms of what does it look like folding out, you know, it, whatever happens, you know, we want to see kind of um, the, 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 what do I say, nitty gritty pieces of everything, it, yes, everything, everything that's too. involved in it. So um, we, we couldn't get a copy of that. Maybe that's a recommendation for um, administration to provide the board a copy. I think that would be a great idea and it would give us an opportunity to further kind of dive in a little bit more and seeing what exactly is behind this. Administration, any other further questions on this particular house bill? Mr. Kearney. Oh, yes, board member Moffitt. So, Mr. Kearney, thank you so much for that. I do want to know if maybe we should be lobbying with an opinion from the administration and maybe we can get some board members. You can set up some meetings for board members to meet with legislators. Um, to kind of advocate our position, is that possible? Um, sure, certainly. If if the uh, if the board or the administration has an opinion, I I I mean that's my job. So you tell me what you what you what you think about it, and I'll make sure that uh, that's that's expressed. So I've I've taken the opportunity of sending a copy of the um, of the bill and the analysis to the chair. Uh, just now, and so I'm more than happy to uh, to advocate strongly in whichever whichever way the administration um, would like or the uh, the board would like. So, Dr. Davis or Chair, board members, please let me know. Thank you. And did you have anything else, Mr. Dr. Moffitt? Did you have something else? 
Well, I just know that this has been getting a lot of press um, with regard to a position. Um, people have been talking about this, and there's pros and cons to both sides. And one of the things is that um, there was another, uh, there was some conversation amongst other elected board members in different districts to actually lobby a position. So that's what I was talking about. Well, I have a hard time understanding you, Dr. Moffat, just a little bit. You sound a little mumbly, but I just want to make sure I heard uh, correctly. You said that you wanted the board members to come together to make sure that we are um, lobbying forth because there are other uh, school districts that are lobbying to support? Pretty much, yes. Thank you. And I know that you were still presenting, Mr. Kearney, so I do apologize for oh. stopping you to kind of discuss no, no, no. that particular topic. But was there anything else in terms of some of the other things that you wanted to bring forth? Um, um, no, I just wanted to um, to highlight there's some information about uh, the election. Uh, and then the governor makes appointments from time to time. And I just highlighted some of the people that are from Hamilton County. I just put their names in bold. I don't know that there's anything particularly special about that, but just wanted to make sure that you noted that. And I'm referring to page 12 and page 14. Um, and so that's that's essentially the, the report. So what will happen though going forward is um, after election day, things will get very crazy in Columbus. And so that will be the time where there'll be a lot of interaction between uh, the work that we do and the administration and the board. I know that uh, the summer you probably thought, oh my gosh, what's going on? It seems so slow, but that's just the pattern of the, the legislative cycle in Ohio. I don't know how else to explain it. I did have two questions, and I know I had mentioned to you before um, if you had heard about the state coming with um, or presenting three mental health days for students in schools. I'm not quite sure if you have any further information on that. Uh, yes, yeah, so you, you asked me about uh, mental health days. It was introduced by uh, two members in the Ohio House. One of them is a local candidate, Jessica Miranda, a local representative. And so that would provide students with three days of a mental health break if it were to pass. I, I don't know that it will get through lame duck. I don't, I don't want to raise anyone's hopes, okay. uh, but... So you'll keep us updated mm -hmm. on that. And last, I know that we had discussed before about trying to plan a meeting with the different individuals in Columbus. So right. I am going to bring that back up. I know that um, I also talked with my committee members in terms of trying to connect that. I know election time is coming up, so I'm not quite sure if this is the great time to do it, um, but just wanted to hear your opinion on that. No, it's it's still there. We're still planning it. It's just that, um, you know, it's tough to get on their calendar be, be, until after the election. <laughs> and so what will happen is the two weeks in November, think about in between Thanksgiving and Election Day, those will be ripe times because all the legislators will be in Columbus. And then think about the first two weeks in uh, December, and those will be other times. Can you say those dates again, just to make sure I oh, heard you? Oh, okay, correctly. sure. Um, let me pull up my calendar so I can not speak in generalities. So if you think of the week of, oh boy, the week of November 14th, the week of November 28th, the week of December 5th, the week of December 12th. Those would be the four prime weeks. We will discuss, I will present this to the board and we will figure out a, a day yep. and time. So hopefully We've that got the location out. set. We've got uh, invitation, not invitations, but notices to people that, okay. that you would like to meet, you as a board would like to meet. So we just have to find the date when, when they will be there. All right, thank you so much. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Mr. Kearney, you did a great job. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. All right.
All right, next up we have a presentation on some very important topics that we want to discuss currently in our district. They include sexual abuse, sexual discrimination, sexual harassment prevention, dating violence, and sexual orientation, LGBTQ+. And we have Dr. Pamela Davis, Chief of Staff, who will present. Oop, microphone. <laughs> yes. I think you are on now. Testing? Yes. yes. Thank you. Loud and clear. Wonderful. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I believe you have access to the presentation and it's projected. So we'll start right out with the first slide. Um, Rob, if you're ready. So the opening slides I have are centered around just our board policy um, as it relates to uh, equity and excellence. So barrier-free learning environment and that we embrace diversity. You'll go to the next slide. Um, the second policy I wanted to call out is the one with respect to non-discrimination and access. Um, we've done uh, the pre-work in terms of making sure that um, discrimination is not um, around the areas of religion, race, color, natural origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity or expression, disability or age. And so in those five uh, bodies of work, content area, PD, student access, district support, and student evaluation, we are calling out our stance against uh, discrimination. The third board policy is around harassment that is relevant to this work. And uh, you'll hear a reference to that as we go through the slides. All right, so with these five areas, the presentation that you're, you'll be viewing um, does not necessarily go in the order that you called the content out, but it does address each one. So I want to start with the definitions of a few of our code of conduct offenses that are related to the areas. Uh, this is actual language from our student guide, which um, our code of conduct is embodied inside of it. So our bullying, harassment, and intimidation Description, sexual misconduct, sexual assault, and sexting. You'll see the first two, the bullying, harassment, and intimidation, although they're lumped together, along with sexual misconduct, those are class two categories. And then uh, sexual assault and sexting are considered class three or our most highest offenses. Um, in terms of, and this is just an ad, you're fine right there, Rob, it, this is just an ad, our discipline, discipline committee meets monthly and provides input in terms of just the edits and um, recommendations for the board as we make updates to this code of conduct um, annually. So on this slide, uh, we've extracted data points that are tied to those five, six areas that uh, are being called out for our time together today. And so I just want to kind of speak to and drill down as to what you're looking at here. So those four categories, harassment and intimidation, which also includes bullying, but I have bullying broken out on the next slide, but that top line encompasses the number of incidents or offenses that occurred last school year for that particular category across all of our schools. Likewise for sexting, sexual misconduct, and sexual. It's important to note that, uh, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, Rob, that for bullying, the numbers that I've called out here are the number of confirmed cases for bullying that were on the basis of discrimination related to sex, race, color, uh, origin, or disability. But the, the sum total of all bullying cases was 64. I'm just highlighting the 11 that were specific to what we're speaking about today. Next slide, please. So in terms of the support that's available, we do have mandatory training for our staff. Uh, in the areas of uh, prevention of child abuse, violence, and substance abuse. Um, we're highlighting just the policies that I've already mentioned around uh, harassment, intimidation, bullying. And then we additionally have the youth suicide prevention and awareness training for our CPS employees. Um, 
I wanted to highlight here the required staff. So in talking with our HR team, uh, when it comes to um, the required trainings that are listed there for this coming year, um, the rotation, or there is um, a, a rotation of five years. So as employees complete a training, that training is good for um, a period of time. The dating violence one that is down there, uh, identification and prevention, that is also a required training. And it is um, employees are tracked in our safe school system whereby um, it is the training is good for five years. And um, the dating violence one, that's, that's the one that I'm talking about, that's good for five years. The others are on rotation. I don't have that information in front of me right here, but I do know it is tracked through Safe Schools platform. And as employees complete the training, depending upon where we are in the cycle, uh, is what is determined whether or not they have to take it for following years. So let me just restate that for my, make sure uh, you're clear that the, the trainings have a set window of time on them. And it may not be annually that each employee takes it, but as a district we're tracking and it is on the employee's profile when they log in to see if it is a required training that they need to take based on the time that they are employed. Next slide, this is on addressing and preventing da uh, dating, and violent, dating violence. And so we have um, the training that I just discussed on the previous slide, but there are also um, individual small group presentations that are available through uh, our educator support personnel. And those people are specifically our school social workers uh, psychologists and uh, counselors. There are two groups that we partner with uh, when there is a need to reach outside for external support and that those groups are Women Helping Women and the YWCA. The next two slides kind of speak to the, um, the PBIS framework and um, this uh, kind of shows the graphic. If you go to that slide for me, yes, the graphic that speaks to um, the different elements that all point to whole child development and support. So, of course, equity and anti-racist lens is uh, at the top, but through our restorative practices, SEL curriculum, and along with our trauma-informed care curriculum, these uh, build skills in both our adults and our students to help um, address the um, prevention as well as support in the categories that we're talking about today. Next slide. Uh, another area of support is our cultural responsiveness field guide. And in this document, it has resources for trainers and students. If you'll go to um, the next two slides, show the behavioral expectations. Uh, in terms of this first one is uh, the big idea that we create a culture that is clear, positive, and consistent. Next slide. This one is on behavioral problem behavior definitions. And again, it makes sure that both students and adults uh, recognize the procedures for staff to respond whenever there is inappropriate behavior. And then the last one is on classroom procedures, ensuring that systems are aligned school-wide to improve outcomes for kids. I think the final area um, that I'll talk about today is the support for our LGBTQ plus community. Um, in talking with team members, one of the first things that was highlighted was just the pre-work that was done in terms of ensuring that all of our schools had gender neutral restrooms. Um, when it comes to clubs uh, for our special populations, it uh, starting clubs happens just like any other club would start. There is uh, identifying sponsorship in terms of the adult uh, interest in terms of the students. And so uh, we do have gay straight alliances or student clubs that are available at some of our schools. 
all schools having designated safe spaces, uh, the preferred name option in power school, access to our mental health providers, and support from Project Connect. Um, I do want to mention just the professional development opportunity through one of our community partners, Kristen Vaught. They are responsible for providing um, some of the training that occurs at the Promise Center. There's a listing there in front of you for the trainings that have been offered throughout the year uh, during the span of 2019 to 2022. Uh, I believe the last thing that I'll mention is just um, calling out the continued uh, efforts to ensure that we are inclusive in terms of training as well as opportunities for students that are in our LGBTQ plus community. So with that, I'll just pause and entertain any questions for any sections that you'd like to go back to. Yes, can we actually go back to the slide that had the um data points on it, please. Um, no, it was in the beginning part where it had the percentages. So I know that I have a couple of questions and I'll open it up to see if anybody else has any questions. Um, yes, right there. So as you're looking into the box where it says additional statistics, it says 33.3% occurred in high school versus 66.4. What is that pertaining to? So this is speaking to the uh, incidents in the chart in terms of the number or the percentage of those incidents that were committed by students in high school versus those that were committed by students in um, elementary. And is that including all four of those harassment, sex, yes. and sexual misconduct, yes. sexual assault? Okay. Um, so in regards to what you presented about the specific um, data points, are we seeing um, a rise or a decrease in actual numbers for dating violence? Um, I am curious a little bit about that in terms of in our high school. Um, it's coming forward to ask for help or to, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Where they're not telling on someone, but they're reporting. reporting. Yes, yes, thank you, reporting. my mind today. Reporting on that. Have we seen an increase or a decrease? And do you have actual data numbers for that? So I did not bring actual data numbers. I am going to call on Dan just in terms of past numbers. Okay, uh, this that would be the, great. Yes. The data that I am speaking to is just specific to last school year. Mm -hmm. um, I do know just in talking with the team members from Positive School Culture that uh, we're very fortunate in CPS to have uh, social workers in each one of our buildings, as well as the partnerships with our um, therapeutic and healthcare providers. Wherever you would like, so, Dan. The microphone, this microphone, whichever one. Yes, yeah, so, but in terms of the historical piece, um, you don't mind. Yes, so Dan, the question is, in terms of dating violence, discrimination, abuse, I will also get into something else after that. I just want to know specifically the numbers in terms of rising or decreasing, especially for this school year versus other school years in the past. And specifically with what, what category of offenses? All of, all of the above. So as I, as I think in terms of, um, you know, there's a difference between the years where we were shut down partially. Right. Beyond that, uh, we've we've not noticed, I think, any substantial uh, difference. You know, I'm most familiar with the bullying statistics, for example, and, and so the effect that we've seen with bullying, kind of a similar category of offense, where we, um, you know, when when we focus on bullying and get a lot of information out to students about bullying and parents and about how to report bullying our numbers tend to go up. I don't think that necessarily means that there's more bullying offenses that happened in that school year. In fact, we encourage parents to report bullying. We encourage students to report bullying. That's, that's the only way we can do anything about it. So there's this sort of cause and effect, and you can, you can see it very clearly. When, when awareness of bullying uh, goes up, we, we view that as a positive. We don't necessarily view it as a negative when some of those statistics go up. 
because that's more incidents that we can get involved in, that, that we can prevent, that we can help a kid who may not have shared with anyone previously that there was bullying. So, I, you know, I, I don't know if that answers your question directly. I, I'd have to look at, you know, each individual category, but. And yeah. that is what I will like, and I will probably ask a little bit um, further into that. But my next question in terms of our students who identify in the LGBTQ Plus, sure. how is that uh, looking in terms of numbers um, for bullying or for harassment? How are those numbers looking and how are they being affected? Yeah, so the, the our only real way of being able to track that, uh, and it, it's cited here, is through, in one of the slides, was cited through the CRDC study. That's a federal requirement that for certain categories of offenses, the administrator who's entering it or the teacher who's entering it has to put in additional categories of information. Let me give you an example. If there was a theft in the school, somebody stole something, mm -hmm. we wouldn't necessarily track any information about the race, gender uh, of the victim. I mean, we would know nothing about the victim. There'd be something that shows up in the offender's power school log that says Johnny mm -hmm. stole Susie's notebook today, but we're not tracking anything with respect to the victim. With the CRDC study for harassment, um, at bullying, and, and other categories like that, there is a, a, a bit of additional information that is captured, and, and that I think is what we're showing here. So um, and it's not broken down by necessarily by, um, but but I believe it is that we do have some data on that for just those specific categories. All right. So before I have some other questions, further questions, I will open it up to my colleagues in regards to if they have anything. Yep. And Dan, I don't think your mic is on either. Your mic. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Davis, for presenting the information. Um, I, I, I understand this as being fairly generic, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, I think, though, I recall us probably earlier in the year um, talking specifically about certain aspects of the information, such as the discipline data, that we that the committee was really interested in seeing more breakdown of data because as I understand it, Daniel, and you can help me with this, um, we uh, we are it's a requirement by statute that the board gets a discipline report on a quarterly basis. Is that true? Is that it's true? bullying statistics bullying and it's statistics. It's twice per year. It, twice per year. That's it. Okay, so it's not quarterly. That's I just right. want to be sure. And does that only include bullying? I'm sorry. Does it only include bullying in that it's, report? It is specific. It's an Ohio okay. statute that's specific to bullying. Okay. So I think my point is that unless we can see data broken out by category, by, um, you know, categorically with very specific statistics, it's hard for us to know even what questions to ask. I, I, you know, so um, I, I think what I'm trying to say is, um, I, I personally believe that there's been lots of improvement within the district on reporting and following up and having sat behind or being a part of a legal situation where I was deposed on something. I know enough to ask <laughs> or to comment about how important it is for us to really track that. So it would be helpful just to break down some of this data, let us see what the aggregate data looks like at, at a point in time, you know, and it can be broken down. However, I think we got to start somewhere in really looking at that. I do believe that the social workers have had a significant impact at the school level. I do believe that. And it would even be helpful to know how many incidents get reported to them mm -hmm. where there's an intervention Absolutely. and what happens, you know, that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff I think would be helpful yes. to board members to see. Um, so, and then finally, um, when we're talking about bullying and the definition, our, the policy around it defines it, it's very clear definition, but I think oftentimes parents, um, parents and or students and staff may define it differently. I want to make sure that we are 
implementing a policy that is clear and concise and consistent across that. Because, you know, I think there are times when parents may have a different definition of what bullying is. And then finally, my question is, how often is the bully button being used? And how is that followed up when the bully button is utilized? I'll start first. Thank you, Vice President Jones. So I completely agree with you about the accessibility of the data. So the discipline data encompasses a lot of other indicators other than this. So unfortunately, I did not bring that in because I just focused on this. But that is very much available on a quarterly or any other cadence. In terms of bullying and the number of incidents that are reported, so much like General Counsel mentioned, we very much encourage parents and students to use the bullying button. We don't dictate how to or how often. We encourage you so that the team members in our Bully Prevention Office have an opportunity to review the information, not only within PSC, Positive School Culture, but also in talking and working with the schools. We can definitely get you the complete numbers. This particular slide, Rob, if you will go to the slide that is after the chart, or maybe this is it. This is the slide after the chart. So the bullying incidents that I listed here were just specific to these topics that we're talking about today. But there were a total of 64 confirmed, mind you, many others that were reported. And so that's a number that I'll have to bring back to you. I did not bring that in here today. I want to speak to that point. Are you saying that only, that there were only 64 button pushing? No, ma'am. There were 64 incidents. So what, those are confirmed. Substantiated. Substantiated. Okay. So there were more reported, but of those, 64 of those sort of met our definition of what we, what constitutes bullying, and those were addressed accordingly. Yes, ma'am, for last school year only. Gotcha. Okay. So I would just agree with Board Member Jones in getting that information back to us and being a little bit more specific and breaking it down. As she stated, I would like to know how many times has the bully button been pushed and, you know, not literally pushed, but reported. And there are some other things that you can break down too as well in terms of the discipline. Can I just add to that? Yes, you can add. As a follow-up, because when we say we want data, you don't have to bring us all the data. But I think because the discipline report, it's required that we see that. It might be helpful just to start with that because I think some of the bullying may be incorporated in that or different categories of that. Yes, I think that's a good start, but I would also like the additional pieces too that I asked for because I would like to see that. I think that is very important in terms of these particular topics. I understand, and I do apologize that I... I'm literal, and I did not consider bringing the entire. It's fine, and so see, we can ask for that, and then you can just bring it along. That's why we're here in the committee. Is Dr. Moffitt available? She did put some comments in chat. Okay, go right ahead. Would like to see data on staff reports of bullying. We need info on discipline data per school by demographic. Would like data on cases reported and substantiated will have given before and findings per school. Okay, thank you. She hit it right on the nail. Yes. Yeah, so just to add to that, so the bullying reports that we mentioned that go to the board twice per year, they're also posted online. So they're on our website and can be found on the Positive School Culture Plan. Can you just send that link to us? Yep, I will send the link. We have the report from last year and then from every year for the previous five years. Then the other thing I wanted to mention, just so we're really specific about the data that you're requesting, because a couple different sources. So, for example, PowerSchool is our student information system. If you were asking for information on number of substantiated cases, that's probably where you'd look, because you're looking in kids, essentially their school discipline file. So on this date, you know, this incident happened, and this was the student who was disciplined for it. The bullying reports 
which again, we, we invite people to report bullying mm -hmm. and they can, they can, it, and as Dr. Davis said, not all of those cases are substantiated or there may be multiple reports of one incident, but we keep, you know, that, that is a up-to-date, uh, the principals receive that information, the district's bullying office receives it. Just to give you some context, to date uh, in 22-23, the bullying button has been pressed 227 times. Mm -hmm. um, of those, 75 reports have been completed, um, and it's been misused. And it, ha it gets misused as well because anybody can press it. Um, uh, it's been misused 23 times. That's pretty comparable to last year where, for the course of the year, there were 576 times that the bullying button was pressed. Of those 456 in, were, matters were investigated, 113 were determined to be misused. So we're, we're you know, about the same. I, I wanna say one more time, I, we don't view it as a problem. We, we want people to report bullying. In fact, Absolutely. so we did training this year with our principals. We did training with our assistant principals. We have provided to schools a QR code mm -hmm. that they can put post within the building, making it easier and easier to report bullying. Even if that means that the reports of bullying goes up to us, that that's that's you know that's more that we can look into, investigate, etc. I hope that's helpful. So as you're relating to saying all of the professional development that you've done for your staff and for the teachers, um, the one concern, and it may not be a concern, but I'm noticing that I have not really heard what else is being done for the actual students. I know that you say that you have partners who can help and be a resource, but my big concern would be how are the students' voices being heard in regards to these particular topics, and especially as it relates to our students of the LGBTQ+. Are you surveying them to ask them what is it that they want to hear or be educated on, specifically as it relates to these topics? And I know that you cited the policies today, which is great. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, it allows the community to see that this is what our board policies are, but how do we hear the student's voice and their needs? Thank you, uh, Board Member Weinberg. So um, it is something that we can dig into deeper in terms of citing uh, more specific um, ways, uh, particularly the, the general, the generality of having staff available, having safe spaces, mm -hmm. but it's an area where we can um, uh, survey or at least have small groups, student focus groups, to hear from them firsthand about um, other things that they may be experiencing that we can support yes, them. Yes, absolutely. In. Board Member Jones, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah uh, just a, a final comment. I wanted to make a distinction. Um, all of this is important data. All of these are important um, matters that the district should be concerned about, and I'm sure we have lots of data for all of them. I think the one thing, though, that raises is, um, a high, it, it's all important, but it raises a high priority need for me because it is required to report it to the board around the discipline data, which is in some ways different than just the bully data, the bullying data. And so I know that in our, in establishing our board priorities mm -hmm. and kind of where we're like the, and wanting to move, how we're wanting to move forward, um, it is looking at the inequities of the discipline data and so when as we start digging a little more and looking at that data we need, we want the information that breaks out demographically and you know by incidents and all of that and i just wanted to be clear about that because it is different than the bully data yes okay i i, I completely agree and as yeah. i said i just didn't see the ask for the discipline data but i will definitely it, it is available and yeah, it is absolutely. broken out just like you asked for by okay. school um, that's, that's fine. gender no and problem. specific uh, infractions so so we will kind of shoot out a reminder email from Ms. Bellis on just making sure we get that information Perfect. so thank you so much you did a great job on that on the presentation thank you dan you can you can stay or you can leave dan but <laughs> We are going to move on to our next part, and we're just gonna have a quick discussion here with my lovely colleague about our work plan. So for the Health and Safety Committee, we draft a work plan for uh, this particular year, and in terms of making sure that we're hitting some of our goals and strategy here for health and safety. 
But what I want to ask is looking over this calendar in terms of per month, some of the topics that health and safety covers, board member Jones and board member Moffitt, is there anything that you see that we need to change? Is there anything that you see that we might need to add? And I just would like to also say for the record, and I wanna make a recommendation in the fact of making sure that we are able to keep the health and safety committee. Um, I think it's definitely an important committee. Um, as long as we have the work plan in place and we're very transparent and we're utilizing it um, to make making sure that we're holding our district and our superintendent um, accountable as well for our students. So I'm gonna open it up, uh, board member Jones or board member uh, Moffitt, if there are any topics in the different months that you see that maybe we can change or does it look good enough to keep as is? I'll, I'll start. Uh, All right. I think it's a, a very good mix of health and safety topics and I 100% support the recommendation to continue the health and safety com committee um, work because I, I do think that there's something to be said about you know, the processes that have been put in place right. where we can review data and, and look at what's really going on with these topics. I don't have anything to add okay. to this. I will say that, you know, there are a couple of topics that um, overlap uh, with things like student achievement and things. We just need to be right. aware of that okay. and, and address that as it comes. But other than that, I don't have any additions. This Board Member Moffitt, she's silent. She doesn't have anything to add. Oh, she's no longer with us. Okay. Well, I think that it looks good as well. And so I'm going to state that we are uh, looking good and we will follow back, I guess, follow back up in January. But I think these topics are um, perfect. All right. I don't think we have anything else except for a couple of other business items. And then, of course, do we have anything, anyone who wants to speak? No one wants to speak? Okay. I have one quick thing on other business. Um, I have been getting a lot of emails. I know the board has been getting a lot of emails on bus safety and as part of health and safety. I wanted to bring that up um, and just kind of have a brief discussion on how can we, uh, I guess, get the data on the number of bus incidents that occur um, where our children are either uh, being late to school, the bus isn't showing up, they're being dropped off in wrong spaces, they're not being picked up at all. How can we get the data showing the different areas and specific to the numbers and to elementary school or high school? I think I would like to see that. Um, because right now we have some members in the community who are very upset with their children being left behind or with their children not being picked up. So I think that's a concern to bring to you guys' attention. Okay, um, thank you, Board Member Weinberg. I believe um, the the starting point would just be in identifying the what our pool of incidents are mm -hmm. that, that that we're interested in. So arriving, a, a late arrival, late pickup, mm -hmm. and um, because this is not something that is going necessarily into a portal. Yes, we may receive information as a concern uh, in the call center. But um, in terms of, so when you first started talking, I thought you were referring to uh, bus incidents where there's misbehavior or something. So that gets reported. I would like to include it all. I think okay. bus incidents that occur, whether it's with behavior on the buses, okay. and then I would like to know in terms of buses that are late to school, buses that don't come to pick kids up, buses that drop kids off, and buses that don't drop kids off. I think that's all very important in terms of the safety of, of each of the students of CPS. Okay, and so um, I'll just need to re review those and push that, that over to our Chief Operations yep. Officer. So I would just like to make that as an assignment, um, making sure that we get the date on the number of bus incidents that have occurred since August that include late buses, no-show buses, discipline incidents, and any incidents where kids have been forgotten or not dropped off at the right stop. Any other comments? Other business? Board Member Jones. No, I just want to make sure that the, the it, we're making assignments. I just want to make sure that all of them capture. So there's the transportation one, mm -hmm. then there's the, uh, data. Discipline, the discipline data, data. and bullying data. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say I think those were the only two. Those were the only two. Did I, did I miss anything okay. else? 
And I think just to, for, for Dr. Davis, um, I, you know, I, I always look at it as you start from a baseline and mm -hmm. you improve on that, right? Mm -hmm. So it, the, the data doesn't, we're not, do I want a perfect report? Yes, but I realize, I think we realize that um, that the beginning of it is just the beginning, and yeah. so it allows us to kind of question and look at. I, for me, I'd rather respond to something that's right here in front of me yes. than to try to think through what specifically I'm looking for, because I don't know what I'm looking for until right. I see something. So, yeah. Well, we can't make it up. It's actually there. <laughs> yes. It exists. Exactly. So, right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. So we just want to see what's there, and yes, then we'll move from there. And then we'll move from there. Well, thank you, everyone. Having no other business, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks so much. I appreciate you.